time apart in life. It was the first time I'd ever taught this class, and it was a sort of special topics class. And I realized that what people create very much comes from the lives that they lead. And, and, uh, and, and then there's also this sort of uh, intersect between art and life, and how art might influence the way we live as well. So sort of the, the whole talk is, is very much in relationship to that. And uh, one of my favorite phrases is simply to notice what you notice. And uh, I had the good fortune of going to India in February, and I was just walking down the street of a small town in India, and I noticed this watermelon, and I looked closely, and I realized this watermelon had been dyed red. I mean, it was this intense dye, and I quickly turned around to find someone who might tell me why this was so, and this gentleman was kind enough to say, yeah, they, they do this. It, they break watermelons in front of stores if the sales aren't very good, hoping to change the karma of the store so the sales were increased. I found these type of rituals everywhere. It's just a, a really, when you go to another country and immerse yourself in a, in a different living situation, I work with the, the potters in the Dharavi slums, and they, you know, just the fuel they used to burn kilns, it was just uh, a remarkable experience to put yourself in a completely different situation. We were talking at lunch, I guess, uh, Tibetan Buddhist was here doing sand uh, mandalas, uh, and then this day in India, particularly in in front of all the Hindu homes do these colognes every morning uh, where they're rice drawings and the women of the home do them and again it's to sort of pay homage and gratitude uh, to their lives and I was just so struck by how integrated the art was into their daily lives. And you know, on most all the campuses, the Commonwealth campuses and, and um, I know up at University Park there's all these vending machines uh, where you can get a free newspaper. The New York Times on the if you buy one, it costs two fifty, but they're trying to give it away. And I think one of the things I've noticed in terms of teaching is I keep getting older, but my students are forever young. <laughs> but times are changing so radically. And uh, this is the last ditch attempt, really, for the newspapers, hoping that the younger generation will somehow want hard copy or keep reading. And so this idea of change, and you can't get people to agree on many things, except that things are changing at a faster and faster rate. So not too long ago, one of my students said, Chris, you know you can throw your pots on the iPhone? You can throw pots on an iPhone? And I was just sort of taken back. I said, you've got to be kidding. And they said, no, and sure enough, you could throw a pot on an iPhone. And uh, what I soon realized, you, you could not throw it off center. And one of the most elemental parts of throwing a pot is learning how to put a pot on center. So one of the most talked about topics today is the difference between the analog and the digital. Analog is like nature, it's the way water flows down the stream, and digital obviously is zeros and ones in programming. And I, you know, we could talk about this maybe later in the, in the uh, philosophy class and art class, but, you know, I think one of the biggest challenges is going to be this uh, relationship between the analog and digital, and frankly stories, and how the digital can help personalize, individualize, and make connections and so forth. So uh, the IT people, in terms of technology, got so excited. One of the guys said, you have to have come and talk to me. And he said, he wanted to create a second life for me. <laughs> create a you know, whole gallery thing and an avatar. He said, yeah, I can make these special slippers and everything else. And, and, and I'm thinking, I can't even deal with my first life. I don't know about existing on a second life. And then when you do travel, this is in China, and I realized quickly when I watched this building being built, they were throwing bricks up three flights of stairs. There's no lawyers in China. <laughs> you can do anything you want to get something done there. And so, I think one of the biggest banes of our existence are expectations. And I've noticed the fewer expectations, we just take things as they come. And I remember going to China and they didn't have a wheel for me to use, except this one wheel that I could only use part of the time. And it was an on-off switch. It either didn't go or went 100 miles an hour. <laughs> so it's like, you know, that idea of adapting to the unknown. And I think, too, in terms of the creative process, which I'm very much intrigued with in terms of uh, where ideas come from, and the idea that a process can actually save us from the poverty of our own intentions, in other words, just watching and observing what you do, and that can sort of inspire you to do something you wouldn't otherwise do. And then I, for a long time, have always collected quotes. And uh, uh, Barbara Hepworth, the late British sculptor, once said, perhaps what one wants to say is formed in one's childhood, and we spend the rest of our lives trying to say it. So when I work with students and they're trying to find their own voice, they need to know their own voice before they can really express their voice in any medium they're using. 
increasing. So for me, you know, one of the things I've been doing in working with students is asking, what's the most influential experience or circumstances that happened to you growing up that's influenced who you are today? And I think for me, it was one of the things was my father and mother. They got we were moving every two or three years my whole childhood, so I was forever having to adapt and change. But my mother would push us all outside. And we just played with dirt and stones. My whole childhood was just dirt and sticks. And so I became very tactile oriented. And I realized when I held something, not only was I holding the object, but it was in essence holding me. In the sense that it gave me a sense that I existed in some way. And I think that's in one reason why I went on to, um, I'm not even going to attempt to hit this in YouTube, but this goes on and the whole pot moves really quickly and when I saw someone, clay is so malleable, it's like magic. And when I saw someone throwing on the wheel for the first time, it was like uh, this magical uh, physical feat that I became completely mystified by and enamored by and wanted to try myself. So these pots are, you know, I guess 25 years old or something, but I was really dealing with strong senses of form but really wanted to energize the surface. And I would do anything I could to create movement, whether it was cutting with a wire, or adding slip, or both. And so, I love the quote by T.S. Eliot when he looked at the Chinese water jar and it says, it moves perpetually in its stillness. So the idea of captivating motion and having it be frozen. And then also this idea of touch, and how we really don't know something until you've actually touched it. Touch is a form of validation in some way. And so this was actually made by Rubbermaid. And I, uh, they made these plastic bowls, and they put the swipes in the side. They knew that people would want to go immediately to touch these to see if that swipe was still fluid or not. And so a, a lot of my pots early on would actually have finger marks or gestures that would sort of move around the pot. And it became really apparent to me like 1989, I left the tenure track position. It was just for various reasons were sort of untenable, and I just need to move on. And at that time, I I got divorced, and it was an incredibly painful divorce. And then I found out my younger brother had contracted the HIV virus, the AIDS virus. So it was a really dark time. And I think what happened when I went to Montana and worked at the Archie Gray Foundation was this is the type of work I made for about a year, and I wasn't even that conscious of the work I was doing, but I realized, you know, as I was doing it, it was different, and then I realized it was, you know, dealing with all this angst, there was a sense of catharsis, and that art, create, the creative pro that process can actually be a sort of act of healing in some way. And so this is, uh, you know, like three or four feet tall. This is actually a teapot, in terms of, like, that sense of movement, and uh, obviously a sense of agitation going on. And then, uh, as we left Montana, we ended up buying a, a piece of land and we'd go back every summer. And I, the reason I show this image is because I collected, one summer I just collected rocks from old quarries and built the whole first floor of this house out of collected rock. And I remember asking my father when I was growing up, Dad, who made all those uh, stone walls? And he said, oh, the farmers used to take the rocks out of the fields and so forth. I love the history of rocks and that sense of where they came from geologically and what we've done with them. So this is my sort of attempt to sort of uh, celebrate uh, uh, just the stone that I picked up and put the stone on a wet thing and, and created this sort of still life with a couple of vessels and sort of paying homage to that stone. And again, sort of noticing what you notice, you know, just the love of the sky forever changing and then uh, these uh, sort of rocks and relationship to sky, that's a piece of mind on the right. And then that issue of uh, duality, and I think clay has that, the sense that it's so fluid, so malleable, and then it dries and it can be turned into stone. And so I use different types of clay quite often. This is just porcelain and a black clay, and juxtaposing those to each other. And that whole idea of cognitive tension, when you create tension between things, I think is very provocative in some way. So this is like, uh, you know, male, female, hard, soft, night, day, it's dealing with all those different aspects of that duality. You know, there's a great line from one of uh, Mary Oliver's poems, you know, whoever you are, no matter how, how lonely, the world offers itself to your imagination. I was in Jerusalem, and I just came across this uh, stone door, and I, it dawned on me. My God, we invented the door. Someone at some point put two posts and a lentil. And so the rectangle or the square 
is something that's a conceptual sort of form that's been fabricated in our own minds. And then I thought about that, you know, Potter, the relationship to the circle, the relationship between the circle and the square, and how the circle is this incredibly intuitive uh, uh, form found in nature, whether it's your eyes being round, or the sun, or the moon, or the bird's nest that builds its nest is round. And so I wanted to somehow integrate that into some of my own work. So just even throwing a large plate and then pulling this window and this rectangle down. And then I think, you know, most of us wonder what our, what we do is, has any larger implications or ramifications. So I was wondering, you know, what is the meaning behind making handmade objects? Do they have any relevance? in any larger significant way. And so I, you know, in, in looking at art history, Kizomar Malevich, the Russian supremacists, talked about art and changing the world. So I'm really interested in relationships. I'm interested in terms of how we process information. That idea of information is, how is information and knowledge different? And how is knowledge different than wisdom? And where does empathy come from? Is reflection necessary to have empathy? So all these aspects of just how a handmade object might come in. Play. And then I have two daughters, and what I try and do every birthday is make a quick a watercolor painting. And so I'm always interested in thinking of them and what I give them in that painting. Some of the, my ceramic work, I'm just going to show the images and move on, but you can also see that there's a strong figurative uh, relationship. And when I did make functional pots, I mean, one of the most uh, significant questions I was asked in graduate school, where do you want your pots to end up? Do you want them to end up in the living room? Or do you want them to end up in the kitchen? In other words, do you want them to be used every day or do you want them to be looked at? And that sense of clarity can be a strong thing. And so I have had a good, an opportunity to show in some high-end galleries in New York City, but one of the problems with that for me was I still like to show functional pots, but you couldn't command the prices that these galleries wanted to do, so this was my way of at one point creating a Trojan horse and making this sort of shelving unit and then my head stuck in the dip and this was in 1994 and so this was sold sort of a, as a, a, uh, some sort of still life, uh, domestic still life if you will. And then having uh, two daughters, this is uh, my oldest daughter who's now 18, so this is 18 years ago. And uh, your children have an amazing way of asking questions or making observations that somehow uh, is lost on adults. So I think when my daughter was sort of seven or eight, she said, Dad, who's more creative, children or adults? And I was really struck by that question. I said, who do you think? And she said, well, children are. And I said, well, how come? And she said, we have more time. <laughs> and, and so this idea of our relationship to time is really something that I would say if I had to uh, answer what's the most seminal aspect or interest of, of, of my work, I would say it's, it's time in relationship to space. So I was really enamored when Vito Conchi said, time is fast and space is slow. And there's all these pithy little comments, or good things happen slowly, bad things happen fast. So I saw her, you know, this was a few years ago, my daughters were just peeling an orange, and I said, what are you doing? And they said, we're peeling an orange. I said, why are you peeling it that way? And they said, well, why not? <laughs> so the little villages that they used to create. Now, I am really intrigued. We live in an age of distraction. I mean, the, you read any of the, uh, what the, the Pell uh, uh, studies or so forth, that average person spending seven to eight hours in front of a screen outside of work. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, what's lost upon us is captured in this, I was walking down the street and this fellow was weaving his uh, lawnmower back and forth and I, you know, politely asked him, I could talk to him, I said, what are you, why are you weaving back and forth? And he said, I'm bored. <laughs> and, so, and so it's good to be bored because boredom leads to uh, all sorts of other creative possibilities. And so one of the things I do is I love to teach, because teaching is about questions. And, and art, the essence of why art is so special is because it's about questions. It's about this sense of wonder and a relationship to the world we live in, which is endless. So when I work with students, I get students all the time that are saying, Chris, you do a pretty good job, they'll ask me a question, you do a pretty good job of facilitating a conversation between yourself and the students. How could you do a better job of facilitating a conversation amongst the students themselves? So I love these questions in terms of like the pedagogy of teaching and just everything we do. So this is 
you know, some of the work, and they've gone on and been very successful. This is Jason Walker. This is all drawn. It's an illustrated porcelain bowl. And this woman's uh, now a grad student, uh, Jennifer Daggs, at, up at Alpha. She was an undergrad. This is just like, from a show a year or two ago. And this is a functional pop uh, by Stephen Colby. I'm going to take this slide out. But this is Matthew Barney. Uh -huh. this, this idea of uh, how uh, interdisciplinary artworks become. You know, you, uh, we have students now that are filmmakers, potters, painters, performance artists. I mean, it's like you do it all. And so just, again, noticing what you notice, this is just an old propane tank that I love the shape of it, and it sort of later influenced a large base form. And when I think uh, I like how Tom mentioned about reading. To be very honest, I was a very poor student academically. And, uh, but my first teaching job, I couldn't believe how much the other professors knew. It was at the Rhode Island School of Design. And I felt like a complete num-num or doofus. And I asked one of the other professors, I said, I didn't have so much to say. And the person simply said, we read. Just read <laughs> our books. So, you know, even the word physiognomy, I'm fascinated with the word physiognomy because everyone's face has a different sort of expression to it, just built in with our flesh and bone. So I thought this pumpkin had a really different <laughs> physiognomy to it. And so just going back to the body, you know, for me, this, the way I attached the handle on this Teapot on the left really was influenced by the torso of the, the woman on the right. And again, we're constantly pushing where things come from. Like I wanted the handles of these, this big black bowl to look like it sort of was like skin being pulled away from the side of the pot. Uh, and you, it's like life is somewhat like a, a I don't know, it's a detective story, but it's about how. When you like something, it's not enough just to say you like something. You have to really probe like a miner deeper and find out why you like something. And I've noticed I've always liked straight lines in relationship to curves. And I like that phrase, you know, when you bite your tongue, that idea of teeth next to a softness of a tongue. So the full potential of a curve isn't realized until it's juxtaposed to a straight line. And this just uh, a logo on a, a pump. I just love that logo, the, the yellow and red, and that the sense of straight line next to curves. And you know, you, that, that phrase by Mies van der Rohe, God's in the details, there is always more there than meets the eye. I've, I've been a fine waters at least maybe two or three, maybe four times. It was only the last time I went when I walked down below the stream, and I looked closely and realized and looked at this the waterfall here and how it's parallel to the house and the waterfall here how it's perpendicular and how he mimicked exactly with those two cantilever cement slabs that perpendicular and that and I've gone on two or three tours and no tour guide had ever mentioned that and I know that you know Frank Lloyd Wright was really looking at those waterfalls in relationship to the home This is a series of small covered jars. <coughs> and just, we're intrigued when we see something and we don't know how they're doing it, or that sense of magic. And art can do that. You're not quite understanding. It took me, you know, 10 seconds to figure that, this out, how it worked. And then, so with pop, sometimes I create an optical illusion, like the front. This is even with the top of the rim. So this is all solid, and it's only when you go back in the bowl that it becomes concave. And so back to that idea of time, Norman McLean, the writer, said, it is in the world of slow time that truth and art become one. It is in the world of slow time that truth and art become one. And I really believe that, because to... to to, that you, you come upon new things through reflection and contemplation. And reflection and contemplation take place in slow time. And for any teachers out there, if you ever, uh, you know, to create class discussion, ask a question and then don't say anything. And just sit with silence. Students will fill that silence. And so this idea of touch 
and sort of uh, the space. There's the space inside of a pot that that space holds, but there's also space between pots or between people. And how do you create an object that actually changes the space between people in terms of facilitating some sense of connection or communication? So I just, I, I love the, the cups on the right that were in a sh recent show, and I happen to be at this show, and people were continually <laughs> touching the cups and turning them around. And uh, there's a different sort of sensory uh, awareness that affects time. And senses are really powerful. I mean, just even this thought of smell and taste. Like, smell is an indiscretionary. Uh, we have very little discretion over what we smell. We walk outside, you can smell roadkill. Taste is much different. You're very selective what you put in your mouth. Hence that word, that person's got good taste. So our senses trigger how we navigate through the world. And some of us are, have a heightened different sense in terms of what we do. So this is just with teaching. I'm always trying, thinking of, you know, that phrase, no surprise for the writer, no surprise for the reader. So, as a teacher too, no surprise to the teacher, no surprise to the students. Always trying to learn something as you're doing it. And then this idea of vulnerability. You know, what some people say, uh, David White, the poet, says the biggest challenge in life is to stay vulnerable, or to hazard oneself. And then I'm uh, so intrigued by how universal life is. We all deal with insecurity, or doubt, joys, and tears of joy, tears of sorrow, this sense of our own mortality. And artists, the, ironically, the more personal your work is, often the more universal it becomes. And then, you know, years ago, someone said to me, Chris, have you heard of the four stages of, of learning? And I said, no, tell me about them. And he said, well, it's uh, unconscious incompetence, conscious incompetence, <laughs> conscious competence, and then unconscious competence. And I thought, oh, that's heavy. So they, and, and, uh, and basically it's translated this, unconscious incompetence means you're making bad work, you don't even know you're making bad work. <laughs> conscious incompetence means you're making bad work and you know you're making bad work. Conscious competence means you're making good work and you know you're making good work. Unconscious competence means you're making good work and you can't even comprehend how you did it. it it's like the artwork is taking you to a place, it's informing you of who you are. And that is where the magic in art happens. And in every field, uh, Alexander Fleming, when he discovered uh, you know, penicillin and so forth, it's always that sense of surprise. And so this, this pot for me was a, 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 a talisman, if you will. It, it told me, it validated this. Because I was having to ship this off to a show. The gallery wanted a title for the piece, so I called it the Black Box. I was, I was packing it and looking at it. It was made four months or three months after 9-11. And I know that the form at the top came from watching those planes over and over again, watching flying into the World Trade Center buildings. And I didn't know it at the time. And things percolated up from our unconscious. And again, what you love. I mean, I love walking at night when it snows. I had to put that in my work. And it's why, then I asked myself, why do I like it so much? Well, it's so quiet. Why is it so quiet? Because when things fall, they make sound. So it's counterintuitive. The snow falls and it's quiet. And just that mystery of the unknown. We have the mystery of what our own bodies are in terms of what's inside. And just again, you know, anything that you see in that idea of appropriation, this is just a painting by painter Filipino Lippe, I think in the 1500s, maybe, maybe later. But the, I just so was enthralled with the ribbons, and I just wanted to make a pot that sort of celebrated those floating ribbons. So this, we were talking about haystacks, little crafts. We're sort of coming to the end, it's not too much longer here, but this is up in Maine. And uh, this is the dining hall, and you overlook the Atlantic Ocean. And this, you know, the Ed Larry Barnes designed the whole campus, one of the most beautiful places on earth. And so we send our students every summer to Aramount, to Peters Valley, New Jersey, to Haystack, 
Hines and with Archie Bray. They go out all these places and then they come back with all that knowledge and it's like it pushes the whole ceramics area forward because they've all had these amazing experiences at these different places. And then I've had the good fortune to be, uh, have some relationships with these places. This is the Archie Bray Foundation. It has this you know, $2 million new state-of-the-art studio for residents there. And people go work there. They learn and then they go back to where they're, where they're from. And then I was invited to Sarat uh, Saratoga Boss, the European Ceramic Works Center in Holland. Got to work with artists from around the world. And this is work I did while I was there. So I did a lot of drawing, just charcoal drawing. Some of the clay work. You know, I love you know, when something jumps out at you that you read, it's like someone sharing their thoughts. I don't know if I heard this or read it, but uh, in beauty you can find ugliness, but you can't in pretty. There's something very uh, airbrushed about pretty, but something that's truly beautiful seems to have some depth that sort of grabs you by your soul. That has this haunting beauty about it. And then this idea of collaboration. I'll just quickly, I worked with a young German artist and he said, I want to collaborate with you. And I said, okay, what do you want to do? He says, I want you to sit at the wheel and I'll tell you exactly what to do. <laughs> yeah. And I thought, well, I'll just, I'll be game, I'll do anything. So I sat at the wheel. And he told me to spread the clay out, and then he said, make a cylinder, and then spread it until it starts breaking apart at the top. So this came from just a collaborating with someone. And just, you know, when you do share or create an experience with someone else, it takes you to different places. <laughs> it's called Slice of Night. And then when you see something and really like it, ask yourself why you like it. The piece on the left here is by Rosemary Trockel. And I was just, we've seen tiles like that in so many bathrooms. And she took that same material, that same glaze and that same clay, and just grabbed it with her hands and made this object. And it reminded me that, you know, uh, from ashes to ashes, from dust to dust, that we're basically, everything's cyclical. We come from the earth and we go back to the earth. And I just loved her wide uh, dichotomy or contrast between how she used the material. And so this is just an attempt to me to go back to something I did before, but I was stuck and I wanted to come up with sort of, I used a sort of a dot-us approach to making cups. And I put five nouns and I would write five uh, adjectives and I would just connect a noun and an adjective. So this is called wrinkled rock, called strung out cup, <laughs> called fractured water, called relaxed rolling pin. And I just did that for 16 cups and came up with different shapes. Also challenging yourself, how many ideas, you know, stream of consciousness, and sort of just thumbnail sketches for ideas for possible cups. And then just that idea, you never know what's on the inside of things. This is a big... Uh, oak tree that the branch tore off and there's just the, I realized when the branch came off it was all rotten on the inside. And uh, even with people we never know what's on the inside. You can be highly perceptive and sense what's on the inside of someone, but it's always a mystery. And then we're coming to the end here. This is the third to last slide. And I had a moment that really had a huge influence on me. It's the, Maybe three years ago, I got a call from my youngest brother, Peter, and said, Peter, I, he said, Chris, I've been on Facebook, and the director of our camp, Bob Easton, is in hospice, and I knew Bob was in his 90s, he was actually 92, 
And uh, I went to a camp as a young man, as a counselor for three summers. And sometimes I'll ask these questions. I just want to get a sense of myself and people. And I'll ask my mom, who are the like, two most influential people in your life other than your parents? So Bob was one of those people in my life. He had a huge influence on who I was. And I went to bed realizing he was long for this earth. He wasn't going to be around much longer. And I went to bed on a Wednesday night. In the middle of the night, I got up and I just said, I've got to go visit. This is the last time I'll ever see him. So I got up that morning and called my brother, who was in Milford, PA, and said, Peter, I'm going to drive up to Vermont to see Bob. And I said, do you want to come? And he said, yeah. So we both drove up and out to, outside of Rutland, Vermont. And uh, he was still lucid enough that he could talk. And we talked about camp days. And, uh, and, uh, but I knew it was the last time his days were numbered. And as I was leaving, I'll never forget, he sort of smiled and gave me a thumbs up. And I asked his wife, Ruth, I said, can we stop by the camp? And uh, she said, sure. It had been closed for 20 years. It had just been put in mothballs. So we went back on this cold February day. We were walking around the campsite. And we went up in the top of this loft area. And all the camping equipment was there. All the old uh, tools for the garden and the archery equipment and backpacks. And as I started touching the tools, I couldn't believe how emotional I got. And I realized they weren't just, it wasn't just a garden house. It was all the memories. It was a connection to this time period. It was a connection to people. And uh, that is, in many ways, what art can do. It can transport you to different thoughts and make different connections. And it's not just an object. There's stories that help bond us together. And this is Edward Manet. And uh, these are the last two slides. And Manet had this show. And the, the, the show sold out. And... Uh, there was such enthusiasm. The person that bought this bundle of asparagus paid more than it was worth. You know, like gave him twice the amount of money it's worth. Man, he came in a few days later, and this, this gallery owner said, Man, hey, they love your work. And someone bought these, the, the uh, bundle of white asparagus for twice as much, or you know, half again as much, and gave, insisted they pay more money than we were asking because it was such a great painting. Man, he was touched by this. And he went back to the studio painted a whole other painting and sent the collector this painting with a note that said you forgot one. <laughs> Thank you for your time.